and workers during COVID-19. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this Assembly recognises the significant impact that the COVID-19 crisis has had on the public, notes that the Department for the Economy projections show that more than 100,000 people could be unemployed by the end of 2020, acknowledges that COVID-19 has continued to spread and may result in further restrictions on workers and businesses, expresses deep concern at the political decision to end the furlough scheme in October, and calls on the British Government to extend the furlough scheme to provide future support to businesses and workers during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic as a critical lever to economic recovery. Thank you. I call Nicola Mallon to formally move the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is hard to Sorry, think... Uh, excuse me, Nick. Just, uh, just beg to move. <laughs> Out of practice, Mr. Minister. I beg to move. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the business committee has agreed to allow up to one hour thirty minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the marshalled list. So please open the debate on the motion now. Gurma Agat Nicola Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is hard to think of a more fitting message for this Assembly to unite behind on our first day back after recess than that outlined in the motion we have laid today. It is right that the Executive has agreed to write to the UK Chancellor stating our belief that the furlough scheme should be extended beyond October, and I believe that the louder we make our voices heard on this issue, the more political weight that message will have. I rise to speak today, Mr Deputy Speaker, as the SDLP Assembly Group Leader and an MLA for North Belfast, a community where COVID is compounding disadvantage and deprivation. Families in my part of the world, in North Belfast and indeed across Northern Ireland, are facing a severe cliff edge. The facts are very clear and they are very stark. Over 300 and 30,000 people in Northern Ireland are currently receiving support from the government through both the furlough scheme and the self-employed support scheme. That is 330,000 families who are nothing less than reliant on these schemes for the most basic of life's necessities. Last week, the most senior civil servant in the Department of the Economy was candid enough to say that by the end of this year, the unemployed claimant account here could reach 100,000 people. Even that is a conservative estimate. Take the employees whose jobs are in those sectors which have not yet been allowed to reopen under the current guidelines. So-called wet pubs have caught the headlines in recent weeks, but look beyond that. For example, the arts and culture sector is nowhere near its pre-COVID level. Our theatres, large and small, remain closed Festivals which in normal times run all year round in our cities, towns and rural locations are on hold. Airlines and airports are practically dormant. That means that tens of thousands of people have no work to go to. Are they to be punished financially for adhering to the prevailing government health advice? How can a pilot go to work if the planes are grounded? Where can an actor, a lighting technician or a sound engineer earn their living if the government has closed the theatres? If the level of COVID-19 cases was falling week on week and more sectors of the economy opening up, we would be in a much different place. But we have to be honest with each other. The level of infection is rising, with 118 new cases reported in the last 24-hour period. We are not yet emerging from the coronavirus crisis and that means that we cannot simply shake off the measures which the government put in place to deal with this emergency. Social distancing, a necessary measure which we all should follow at all times, will prevent any form of a smooth path back to full economic activity. That is not the fault of business, and certainly not the responsibility of people who could face redundancy in a few short weeks. We must intervene to protect jobs and promote financial stability. All of us, from this Assembly, our, exec our Executive and, yes, Boris Johnson, you too. If the Government delivers on its intention to end the furlough scheme by October, the UK will stand alone in Europe again. 
but should we be surprised if they do? Over the course of the past 24 hours, reports claim the British Government is planning to end the legal force that would avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. Let me be clear. Brexit is an act of economic self-harm. It will plunge our economy from the crisis of COVID to further crisis. The Ireland Protocol was designed and agreed to protect our island and our economy. And any attempt to rip it up is a further act by Boris Johnson and his Tory government to undermine the wishes of citizens here, citizens who voted to remain in the European Union, of course. The member acknowledged that Northern Ireland's biggest market is actually the GB domestic market and putting anything in the path of businesses trading freely east-west would actually be more devastating to local businesses than anything that could happen north-south. The member will be aware that, of course, everyone is supportive of unfettered access, yet we have to see that materialise in anything coming forth from the British Government. But we have a protocol which is an international agreement, and the British Government must implement the protocol. And the reason I say all of this is because we need to be aware of the context in which we are operating. Our economy and our communities are living through a crisis and facing into the further crisis of Brexit. And the British Government needs to understand that. We need to act now to protect our economy, our workers, our businesses from COVID and prepare for the challenges of Brexit. Furlough is an absolutely necessary part of that plan. It is a safety net for the short term that cannot be removed. This is being recognised and acted upon across Europe. In France, a version of the scheme, flexible and targeted, will run for a full two years initially. In Germany, their short-time working scheme has been extended to 21 months due to the COVID impact. The Spanish government has committed to delivering its support scheme to the end of this year and, if necessary, into 2021. And the Italian government is actively considering a similar extension. A lot has happened since March this year. We will never forget this year, and we all fervently hope that we never have to experience anything similar in the future. This was the year when everyone made enormous sacrifices in order to help each other out. I know that none of that was easy. Our business community in the North is resilient. It does have underlying strength, and I am confident that in time our economy will recover. There is a time ahead of us when our streets will be busy, our pubs opened and full, our entrepreneurs will be exporting goods and services. Our theatres and cinemas will be operating as normal. That time will come. But we are not there yet. And we need to plan to deal with the situation we face in the immediate future. So let our Assembly add its voice to that of Nicola Sturgeon and Scotland. Let us join those businesses and political leaders in Wales who have made the same call. Extend the furlough. Do not abandon entire sectors and the hundreds of thousands who work there. In announcing the scheme back in March, Boris Johnson was explicit. He said, We, the government, will stand by you. We will help workers of all kinds to get through this crisis, supporting them directly in a way government has never done before. The Chancellor told the House of Commons, I want every person in this House and in the country to know that I will never accept unemployment as an unavoidable outcome. So what has changed, Chancellor? Will you stand by those words? Because right now, in the absence of a government support scheme, unemployment is not unavoidable, it is inevitable. You do have the power and you have the resources to make it avoidable, but not by sitting back and doing nothing. We know that Boris Johnson has already ruled out an extension of the furlough scheme. However, this is the Prime Minister who is well used to U-turns. So I am not resigned to the end of the furlough scheme becoming reality in October. In fact, as an Assembly, we should be determined to avoid this disaster by making our position very clear. Let us speak with one united voice and send a message loud and clear. Extend the furlough scheme. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. And I guess now here, I'm sorry, Kiva Archibald, Leshen Lasu, or Hontasi. I now call Kiva Archibald to move the amendment. Um, um, and I think there is likely consensus across the Chamber and more broadly across society that the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme, or the furlough scheme as it is better known, has been a lifeline for many businesses and prevented hundreds of thousands of redundancies. However, the Job Retention Scheme introduced by the British Chancellor has to an extent been rigid since its inception, 
with cut-off dates for employees to be on the payroll, ruling out newly recruited employees, and further cut-off dates in terms of businesses being able to enter the scheme. The most recent figures published on 21 August stated that 249,600 employments have been furloughed over the course of the scheme in the North. The crisis caused by the pandemic has undoubtedly impacted on some sectors and workers more than others, with greater numbers of workers in certain sectors furloughed. The accommodation and food sector has seen business down over 93 per cent in quarter two this year, while manufacturing is down 20 per cent and construction 36.5 per cent. 71 per cent of all eligible employments in construction here have been furloughed. Young people are the most likely to be furloughed, with over 60 per cent of 17-year-olds furloughed and 45 per cent of 20-year-olds. For some businesses, like those in hospitality and tourism, they have not yet been able to reopen while others, for example, in manufacturing and a number of sectors, while operations have restarted, our orders have slowed, and there is little sign that business activity will pick up any time soon, certainly not before the end of October when the scheme is due to end. The changes that have been made to the scheme already have placed a burden on employers in terms of pay paying national insurance and pension contributions from the beginning of August and at least 10 per cent of employee wages since the beginning of September. As a result, we have seen a number of redundancies over recent weeks, and there are likely to be more in coming weeks. So, to try to avoid mass redundancies and to take account of the much slower return to business than perhaps originally anticipated, we have been advocating for the scheme to be extended and for flexibility to be built in to support those sectors most impacted. And I welcome that the Finance Minister is writing to the British Chancellor on behalf of the Executive calling for the scheme to be extended. I think it would be remiss of us when we are talking about the impact on businesses and workers not to also mention those who have been missed out from any support. And the British Chancellor needs to look at reforming other supports, including the Self-Employed Income Support Scheme, to ensure those who have been unfairly excluded due to whatever bureaucratic process and, in some cases, not even able to access universal credit, who may not still be able to go back to work, can also access support. Well, as I said at the beginning, the scheme has been broadly welcomed. That does not, however, mean there is not room for improvement or learning to be had from other countries that have put in place similar schemes. Across the EU, including Germany, France and in the South, their job retention scheme equivalents have been more flexible since the get-go, allowing, for example, for part-time working, while here in the North and across Britain, part-time working through reduction in hours has only been allowed since August. Some of the schemes also allow for claims to be made retrospectively for loss of business. This means that businesses who have recently faced losses or where business has been up and down, which is likely to be a trend for some time, those businesses can enter the schemes, and that is not possible with the, the British version. So, for instance, in the event of any future lockdowns, including localised lockdowns, currently, even if there was an extension to the overall scheme, any business that isn't already in the scheme would be unable to receive help. So it is important that a degree of flexibility is added and that deadlines around entry are reformed to allow for employers that may in the future need support to be able to get it. The, uh, the coronavirus job retention scheme has been an important response, but it also needs to form part of the recovery. Um, in uh, some of the other countries, the scheme has been extended up until as much as December 2021. This is a smart move because any economic recovery strategy has to be about helping businesses respond to changing circumstances. That is not going to happen overnight or in the short term, so businesses will require flexible supports over the next number of months. This is vital to avoid mass redundancies, which would be devastating for workers and their families. Without the the member for giving way. Um, well, I acknowledge, and I'm sure you do, the uh, intervention from the British government and how important it is that they play that role in continuing this furlough scheme and supporting workers. Um, do you agree with me that it is essential that the executive in this place does so much more to support businesses that have already missed out? We know that £56 million is returned from grant funding that hasn't been reallocated, and there are thousands of businesses in Northern Ireland who still haven't been able to avail of any support here. So, is it important, do you think, as part of that joint strategy that we, we play our role here via the executive to support our local businesses? Um, yeah, thank you for the intervention, and, and I, I do agree. And I would hope to see some uh, of the further interventions to support those who have been excluded being brought forward by the Economy Minister um, in the next number of weeks. Um, because without the support of the furlough scheme, businesses which have been able to hit pause will be forced to hit stop as bills pile up and businesses remain either, business remains either impossible or much reduced. 
And just as a final point, um, which is particularly topical today, it's impossible to talk about the short and medium term outlook for businesses without also looking at the impact of Brexit. Given speculation since last night, which seems to be firming up, the likelihood of a decent free trade agreement seems to be slim, and therefore businesses are likely to be facing worsening trade circumstances. For those businesses in the north which trade north-south and east-west, the lack of clarity about how they will be doing business come January is a worry they don't need whilst trying to recover from the worst economic crisis in level memory. The British Government needs to live up to their commitments in terms of implementing the protocol and through the Joint Committee put in place the best possible trading conditions. And the EU needs to ensure the safeguards of the protocol are fully implemented. Graham Elgott. Graham Elgott. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Gordon. Mr Deputy Speaker, and, uh, good to see you back in your place at the top table. I do welcome the opportunity to speak on this very important issue. We all recognise the significant challenges which COVID-19 has brought upon us, not least the severe impact it has had and continues to have on our local economy. It is a global pandemic, and the challenges we face are not exclusive to Northern Ireland. There has been a very significant amount of support delivered by the Executive to date, and particularly through the Department of Economy over the last six months, when we began to face COVID-19 head-on and deliver direct financial support where needed. I believe we must put on record our thanks to the Economy Minister Diane Dodds for her efforts in supporting our local economy as we look to rebuild and regenerate and, most importantly, give confidence for the future. The Finance Minister recently confirmed that £2.2 billion of additional funding has been provided to Northern Ireland to respond to COVID-19. and That figure alone certainly reinforces the value of being part of our great United Kingdom where we have benefited from one of the best economic rescue packages in the world during these unprecedented days. The furlough scheme, the self-employed income support scheme, alongside the various local support schemes, including the 10K and the 25K grants, the Microbusiness Hardship Fund, as well as schemes such as the Bounce Back Loan Scheme from the banks and the various relief measures, have been all been introduced for businesses. As a local MLA, I have been pleased to assist many local business owners who have benefited from these measures and which, which they recognise were a real lifeline for them and their families in these difficult times. I fully recognise that there is need for additional support to sustain jobs in our existing businesses, and there is a real need for Invest NA to look at alternative support for businesses and support upskilling, training, innovation and research and development. Invest NI need to be more proactive rather than reacting to each job crisis when they arise. Encouraging people back into the workplace, including the public sector, back into our town and city centres must continue to be a priority. The public sector must be encouraged back to work in a safe COVID-19 compliant manner. The Eat Out Help Scheme with 2.7 million meals being served. I'm not sure how positive that has been for the health service, but it was a real success uh, in relation to confidence, confidence boosting, an example, a great ex example for the hospitality sector and the general public, eating out in a safe and controlled way whilst protecting valuable jobs and encouraging people to enjoy the very best of Northern Ireland. Will do. Um, Deputy Speaker, while acknowledging um, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme has inevitably been of value uh, to businesses uh, and to those who are able to uh, afford to eat out to help out, could I acknowledge and could I ask the member to acknowledge that there are many of my constituents, as I'm quite sure many of his, who quite simply could not afford to eat out to help out, and the Chancellor might have done more for food banks and others. Thank you for that. And the Minister has ne sorry, the member. Wishful thinking there for you, Gordon. The member, go, the member, go easy, member go has easy. an extra minute, uh, if he so wishes. Well, uh, you know, I think we all recognise as, as elected representatives there is great need out there. We're all aware of the need for food banks. We're also very much aware uh, and recognise the success of the Eat Out scheme. And, you know, there are differences, there are variations, and, and again, we must all do what we can to help those right across the various sectors. 
We have also seen the various business revitalisation scheme, which was rolled out recently, which was supported by DERA and the Department of Communities in conjunction with our local councils to support our town centres, our city centres and villages, and help them to adjust to the new challenges facing such businesses. The Apprenticeship Recovery Scheme, announced last week by the Minister, will see employers receive up to £3,700 for every apprentice brought in to the workplace and retained, and £3,000 for new apprentices, which is exactly the sort of positive financial support scheme we need as we focus on our recovery, growth and the skills for our future. Undoubtedly, challenges will remain with us for some time. Every sector has been impacted by COVID, but certain sectors, including the tourism, hospitality and aerospace sectors, will require tailored support going forward, and we must all continue to work together. The continued support of business through the continuation of the furlough scheme, even in a phased way, is vital as we seek to fur further build confidence in our economy and continue to make Northern Ireland a great place to live, work and to invest. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I now call Mr Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I rise to support the motion and the proposed uh, amendment, um, and more, more particularly the workers and businesses of Northern Ireland who have faced extremely challenging circumstances over the past few months as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Unemployment has historically been a serious and persistent problem here in Northern Ireland, but in recent times it seemed that we were improving on this. It is therefore extremely concerning and disappointing that we could see more than 100,000 people out of work by the end of this year. The coronavirus job retention scheme has indeed been a lifeline to businesses and workers alike. While not perfect, and there have been many who have been excluded and I use that term um, uh, carefully because there is a group called excluded and there are those who do genuinely feel that they have been excluded by all of the schemes. But nevertheless, given the exceptional circumstances and the speed at which the scheme was implemented, it has provided support and stability for millions of workers across the United Kingdom and continued that connection between employer and workers, which would otherwise have been broken and seen a massive spike in unemployment this spring. To, the, to, to end it completely by the end of October, I believe, will be a major, expensive and indeed unnecessary uh, self-inflicted wound. It is perhaps penny-wise and pound-foolish. This will cost us more in the future. Many businesses and workers face an uncertain and difficult winter. These are uh, the otherwise viable businesses in the absence of a pandemic would be employing people, paying taxes and contributing to our economy. These range from travel agents to hotels to soft play facilities to after school time to the aircraft industry. Employers that we need. We need to we need to support these businesses. We need to be able to say we will be supporting you, your employees and your businesses until we can return safely to relative normality. In a similar vein, I welcome the proposed amendment which calls for businesses to be able to furlough staff again if restrictions or closures are again required. I really hope that that will not be the case, but we must continue to support workers and employers as we try to control the virus and be fully aware of the difficulties that these restrictions place on society. The UK furlough, wide furlough scheme, even with its inadequacies, even with those that have been excluded, has been helpful and should continue perhaps in a more targeted form. But there is much more that can be done here to support people. In fact, money is still waiting to be spent and it needs to be decided how to be spent and quickly. There will be extreme anger should any minister in this assembly and in the executive here in Northern Ireland end up returning money to the Treasury. I think, it, it, I think most would be aghast at the underspend on the micro-business hardship fund, not least of all because so many small businesses and sole traders have been excluded again and again. I look forward to meeting the minister later this week with such a group of people to discuss this. It is also crystal clear that we need an economic recovery strategy to focus on creating jobs or future economic 
development with clear actions and measures led by the Department of the Economy. Thus far, we are yet to see anything concrete. Perhaps the Minister for the Economy can, indeed sadly she is not here today, to advise us on what progress is being made. The challenge to the Minister is to produce that plan. We must not allow people to fall back into long-term unemployment, so when jobs cannot be saved, people must be offered the opportunity for supported options to help them back into work. Skills and retraining uh, for our economic recovery are vitally important. We need to seize those opportunities now. I do welcome the announcements on funding for recruitment and retention of apprenticeships. But again, with many on furlough, I have concerns that there quite simply will be a cliff edge for apprentices. We must also note the particular social economic harm that the recession is doing to our young people. It affects their earnings and their careers and their futures. Therefore, I would call on the Communities Minister to get moving with schemes like Kickstart and equivalent schemes for young people who are unemployed. Closing, Mr Speaker, it is clear the UK-wide job retention scheme should continue. Could advise the member to bring his remarks to a close? Please. Indeed, it should be widened and, the, and even in the case of further restrictions. Can I encourage this Assembly to support the amendment and the motion in front of us today? Thank you. I call Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, there is no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on our population. First and foremost, we must continue to recognise the health impact, the hundreds of families who have lost loved ones due to the virus, and the many who continue to suffer with the effects after contracting COVID. We, of course, recognise the serious economic impact that COVID-19 has had and continues to have on the livelihoods of so many of our constituents. We don't have to travel too far within our own constituencies to see the devastating impact that COVID has had on our many businesses and workplaces. Without the significant financial packages and measures put in place through the UK Government, through our own Economy Minister and indeed the wider Executive, the impact no doubt would have been greater in a shorter space of time. The UK Government has provided more than £2 billion in funding in responding to the pandemic, and that does not include the value of the furlough scheme. There is no doubt that the job retention scheme has prevented many businesses from closing their doors and has kept many people in employment. The figures show that roughly 240,000 people were furloughed by mid-July. That is a significant number given the size of our population. In addition to this, the self-employed income scheme has had over 76,000 claims made in Northern Ireland. So based on these figures, that means that around 316,000 jobs in self-employed received support through the retention schemes. That is 36 per cent of those in employment. It has been estimated that in the medium term, many of those who are furloughed are at risk of redundancy, particularly within our SMEs. This presents a significant problem as the job retention scheme comes to an end. As efforts have been made to kickstart our economy, it is evident that for some industries it is going to take much longer than hoped for to recover. This is through no fault of those involved in these sectors, but simply dictated by the nature of their business and the restrictions that continue to be in place for the safety of the public. In a few short weeks, many thousands will be facing the prospect of unemployment and their livelihoods thrown into chaos. It is vitally important that the UK Government addresses the furlough issue and the scheme. This could be done in a targeted way, encouraging businesses back to work, whilst providing a lifeline for some of the industries who are facing particular challenges, such as those within our aviation industry, our travel industry, our entertainment venues and tourism and hospitality sectors. I will indeed. Would you agree with me, while it has been crucial that our businesses and our communities have been able to access one of the most unprecedented financial packages from the British government in our lifetime, certainly in this pandemic. But would he equally agree that it's going to take as innovative as possible approach going forward to ensure that industry can continue to um, cohabit with what is an already alarming situation with the outbreak of COVID in Craig Avenue Area Hospital, for example? And the member has an extra minute to ask, well, add to his remarks. Absolutely, and I completely concur with that point. I think that we do need to be innovative. We do need to look at a targeted approach, and I'm confident that um, you know, the executive has written uh, to the Chancellor. I think it is important that he does take on those views, particularly from the industry leaders as well. 
Our town and city centres are far from what they were seven months ago. There are many more shutters down and empty units. Once busy streets are now empty. When I speak to businesses directly within my own constituency, constituency, particularly in the city centre, they stress the importance of getting public sector staff back into their offices. This must only be done in a safe and practical way. The many coffee shops and restaurants and sandwich bars may have reopened, but they are struggling due to the lack of footfall through the many office workers working from home. We need to bring life back into our town and city centres. I believe there's an opportunity for our government departments to take a lead on this. Absolutely. I am grateful to the member for giving way on this point. Does the member agree that whilst the two billion that he referred to from Treasury represents a significant sub subvention from Westminster to help our economy, ultimately that money is going to have to be paid back? And the best way to safeguard uh, and progress economic recovery is to start moving in as safely a way as possible as to get as much of our economy functioning again. Well, absolutely, and I do agree with that point. It does lead me on to the next point, in that we do need to get uh, life back into our city centre, and we do need to get uh, businesses opened up in as safe a way as possible. And uh, to that end, I think it is important that we recognise the work of the economy minister to try to rebuild our economy economy in this unprecedented environment. We must, too, grasp the opportunities in the emerging sectors, fintech, for example, to drive job creation. We must continue to explore how departments could help uh, firms improve their supply chains or apply dynamic new ideas or technologies. There is a short window of opportunity to ensure that jobs are protected and the economic impact is not worsened. The executive has provided effective short-term measures to support businesses, however long-term strategic plans must now be put into effect. We need to get on with the investment in our city deals. This will give a strong positive signal to businesses that, are, uh, that there is a long-term plan to support and rebuild the affected sectors in the coming month. We must get on too with delivering an infrastructure investment to stimulate connectivity in Northern Ireland through digital education and transport projects. We need to get on with promoting Northern Ireland as a great place to live, work and the travel to. to the, this investment is now more important than ever. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I support the motion and the amendment. I guess initiate him, Sir Melissa McHugh. I now call Melissa McHugh. Graham, I've got a last one, Carla. Uh, I welcome just the opportunity to speak on this motion as well, too. Uh, that since the sort of inception of COVID and the likes of it, we've all become familiar with a, a, a new vocabulary in many respects. Uh, and we, we're starting to come to terms with actually the meaning as well, too, that whenever they talk about suppressing the curve, and even for long in, in that. For many people, you know, they didn't really understand what the concept was. But it isn't enough to say that uh, for one minute that it's uh, something that's complete and absolutely new. It's an instrument. It's an instrument that has been tried and tested for over 100 years for long in itself. And just in the way that we talked about suppressing the curve in order for the health system to be in a position to be able to cope with what, in fact, we knew was coming down the line in terms of the amount of people who would require uh, hospitalisation. So too is it the case with uh, furlonging. That, in fact, if anything, it is there initially to help the system to cope with is unemployment, uh, and we have, in a sense, suppressed that to date. And now, with the suggestion that in October that is going to be removed then we can expect that same surge then in terms of unemployment within this economy. Now, in an economy in itself that has limited um, businesses, much less businesses per head of the population than in Scotland, Wales or in England, all the more reason why it is that we should be there and ensuring that we're protecting those jobs in every respect. Not just in protecting the jobs per se, but also the skills the skills that have been acquired over a long period of time in the whole area of manufacturing and the likes of it, in mid Ulster, uh, an area very close to my own constituency, where it is now, if anything, the manufacturing base here in the north of Ireland. We do, want to be, we do not want to see those skills lost. And that's what Furlonga in itself provides for. It ensures that you still hold on to and secure those skills. Now, as I said, that this was a system tested and tried a long time ago, initially in Germany in the 1920s at the time of hyperinflation, and more lately in 2008 at the time of the world recession, 
once again the Germans were the people that came to the fore and provided the world with a system that ensured that they could uh, at least absorb gently, if anything, uh, the more negative aspects of that same recession that happened at the time. And it isn't by accident that they are the same people now who wish to extend their scheme, their scheme for another two years, because they know exactly the impact that that sudden rise or impact of unemployment will have on their economy. And let's not forget just one other element of this as well, too, when we do talk about workers who haven't been laid off but are forelonged it for they're receiving the greater part of their income, that they're the same people who, if anything, sustain and maintain our domestic economy that is in that other area of the demand for goods and services domestically, that they still have the resources in order to be able to sustain and maintain that. Uh, so again, just I make this point that uh, when we look at it as an instrument, an instrument that can influence so many uh, elements of our economy and itself and our industry, all the more reason why we have to ensure that we give total and absolute support to our executive and to our economy minister as well too, uh, and to our finance minister and making their appeals to the British uh, authorities to ensure that they continue to support uh, a four-long scheme extended well beyond uh, the month of October and have anything for this next two years. And another point just that I do think that it is critical and essential here and it has been alluded to by a number of different speakers. There are people, there are people who would only but now be coming into that whole sphere where they would require that same type of support but have been excluded by a time frame. And I think to it that in itself is despicable. But all the more reason why it has to be looked at very, very carefully to ensure that we get the best possible results for all of our people and for all of our uh, elements of industry as well. Thank you. Good, good. I now call Christopher Stolford, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and welcome back. It's good to see you back in place, not least because it eases the burden on Roy Beggs and myself, and we now get to participate in some of these debates. So it's good to see you back, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I am happy to support the motion and the amendment, although I, I don't wish to be cruel to the previous speaker, but I'm not entirely certain that late 1920s Germany is really an economic model that we want to be following because the member will know that that model was funded through a series of complicated loans which were then called in and, well, read the history books and see how that ended up. Um, I want to make just a few comments about a couple of key sectors of the economy. Uh, firstly, in relation to aerospace, uh, my colleague from FOIL, Mr Middleton, mentioned the aerospace sector. Aerospace employs 10,000 people uh, in Northern Ireland, and the contribution that the aerospace industry makes to our economy runs into the hundreds of millions, if not billions, of pounds. And so I think, but yet it is one of the sectors, because of the unique circumstances that we've been facing, that has been absolutely uh, devastated by uh, COVID-19. So I do think um, there's lots of people in my constituency East Belfast as well, East Antrim, employed in those uh, aeros North Down, employed in those aerospace industries. So it is really important that uh, measures are taken and steps are taken in order uh, to protect them. Anyone who has engaged in, and, and rightly so, I hope we all have, anyone who is engaged in trying to support the local tourism and hospitality sectors around Northern Ireland will have seen so many of our towns, places that we would traditionally go, if, well, certainly if you're from Belfast, places that you traditionally would go during the summer, Port Rush, Newcastle, places like that, completely deserted. And we can all see the impact that COVID has had, particularly since there was an outbreak in, in Newcastle and County Down. You can see the impact um, that that has had. And that's why I think initiatives such as the Eat Out to Help Out scheme taking on board what the member for East Antrim, uh, Mr Dixon, said, were uh, positive uh, and were welcome. The massive scale of the impact uh, that COVID has had is measurable in the fact that the £2 billion of additional expenditure has come from the Treasury uh, to this part of the UK to try and shore up our economy, to ensure that once 
those vast swathes of the economy that have been put into deep storage are brought out of it again, there will actually be something left. I think it's a testimony to the, the benefits of actually being part of the United Kingdom that our government was in a position to provide that subvention. But, and we need to be realistic about this, it's money that our children will be paying back and future generations, perhaps even their children as well, will be paying back. So while I sing the praise of the, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, I'm mindful of the fact that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And the borrowing that has taken place in order... Yes, I'll give way. Thanks very much, for giving way. But I hope you will agree that the Eat Out to Help Out scheme at least got people used to going back in to public houses and to restaurants again and give that hope going forward into the future. Thank you. I absolutely do agree with that. And that's, the I Minister, think, sorry, the oh, member has an extra minute. Thank you. Okay. I absolutely do agree with that. And that's where I think, in a, in a sense, and again, I must, I must underscore and underline that I don't want us to do anything out with the best scientific medical advice. But in a sense, I think we've almost been victims of our own success in terms of putting the frighteners on people to encourage them to stay in a form of lockdown. And if we can encourage people in a safe and managed way out of self-imposed uh, lockdown into businesses like uh, you're mentioning, then I think we should encourage that. Um, so I, I, think that, I think that's absolutely right. Yes, very briefly, yes. But in, in relation to the Eat Out Help Out scheme, the slight contradiction, while it was a good scheme, but we have some of those people that we talked about from the public sector that were perhaps availing of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, but yet citing the same arguments that they couldn't go out in public as to returning to their workplace. I, I think that it's important. I think that it's important that we try to take as broad a view as possible. Uh, I don't want to get into. I'm certainly not going to criticise people if they have legitimate fears and concerns. I think our job as a government is to demonstrate the progress that has been made in addressing those concerns in order to make people feel safe to go out and to, to spend money and to help generate uh, economic uh, recovery. Um, the person who proposed the motion, um, Mrs Mallon, isn't here. Unfortunately, because I heard in her, her introductory remarks, she cited that we should follow the, the lead and the example given by uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, who proved her economic prowess in 2014 by telling us all that a barrel of oil would be $110 today. When I checked on Business Insider, it's $41.98. So I don't think we'll be taking our economic predictions or hypotheses from the SNP-led administration. I would advise member just to bring us. And I've made the point that I want to make. Thank you. Next year, I'm Sir Pat Catney, and I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, thank you. As I said, uh, this is an incredibly important motion. Although more and more of our businesses are able to come back, in some way or form, there are still many out there that are not allowed to open. I obviously need to declare an interest as a former publican, but they are an integral part of our hospitality trade and sector. Across the world, the Ulster Irish pub is famous. They have been part of our history. Relationships have sparked, revolutions plotted, and all the world's ills put right over, as, as I say, all the world's put right in our pubs. They closed in line with government guidance, and they remain closed. Some have been with us for hundreds of years. Uh, I want to speak about um, my friend's bar, Brian, uh, the Maypole in Hollywood. This has been a licensed business since 1857. I know the owner, Brian, well. He is hard work and hands on publican whose family has provided a centre point for the community for decades. I also would like to speak just of another little bar called Lavery's in Chapel Hill that a hundred years ago, just two weeks ago, found itself burnt in the notorious or infamous uh, burnings in Lisburn um, over the shooting of Swansea, who in his place had murdered the Lord Mayor, one of three Lord Mayors in Ireland then, in County Cork, uh, Thomas McHugh. All of these businesses, there is a history attached to them, and that's my reason for bringing that out to you all here now today. 
With support, places like this could be gone forever if we, without support. All of these businesses are happy to comply with public health guidance, but you cannot escape the hypocrisy of some of the guidance and of pubs being blamed for outbreaks when a third of them can't even open. Even for those that can open and doing everything they can to stick to the guidelines, they have had to live in fear of visits from the large number of PSNI officers with the power to shut them down for the smallest infraction, instead of making pubs seem like they are the troublemakers with visitors from the Chief Constable and teams of officers. We need to stop ignoring them, listen to them and work with them. Pubs that have remained closed have lost businesses to the pub down the street. I mean, I know pubs that are selling a bowl of soup. They are traditional wet bars, and they find themselves being able to open. This is very unfair to those public houses that are following the law, because once that business goes, believe me, we're creatures of habit. It's very, very difficult to get that revenue back into your public house, absolutely. I thank the member for giving way, but the member agree with me that support for our social and sports clubs who cannot open under the regulations also require additional support. Otherwise, we, they never, may never reopen, and we would lose vital community hubs in our towns and villages. Absolutely, the member has an extra minute. Absolutely, 100% right on that. There, and uh, they also, like our sporting clubs, be they rugby, GAA, soccer, handball, whatever, uh, are the backbone of those local communities, and it is a source of revenue. So I do have to agree with you on that. But pubs that have remained closed have lost their businesses. As I've said, this won't come back. It's a double hit. Closed bars make no money, but it still costs a lot of money in order to try and maintain them and run them. We need to find a safe way for those small family businesses to open and give way the financial support that they have lacked throughout this pandemic. You know, a lot of public houses, folks, the owners still live above those pubs, all right? And this is strange what I'm going to say to you, but in a way their public house is an extension of their living room. They're very, very responsible people, settled strongly within that community, and you find these pubs have been passed on from generation to generation. Mr Speaker, my office cannot only uh, be overwhelmed by the number of calls and emails coming in from people that could potentially lose their jobs. They come from across our society. They are shopkeepers or trade workers, members of all families. Uh, to just end the support of the furlough scheme in October is just not acceptable. I don't deny that it took a big step to propose the furlough scheme. Surely the steps that need to be taken uh, to continue with it are much more smaller and not beyond the possibility of political thought and ability, Mr Speaker. Of course, I must also mention all of those that have not been able to avail of any of the support mechanisms that have been put in place due to COVID. I have been asking questions for months now of ministers who have assured me there will be more support coming, but still we have 10,000 sole traders and small businesses who have received nothing. The support mechanisms were blunt tools. They had to be set up quickly to help people as quickly as possible, but now we have had time to reflect, time to look at the impact of the scheme, and time to figure out how and what has been missed. We need to look at the underspends in the schemes in our budgets. We cannot go through another budget process without putting something in place for those left behind. Mr Speaker, we must use all of the pressures we can to support those working to get through this terrible time, and I urge you all to support this motion. And the amendment. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, the member I member to draw his remarks to a close, please. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say that. Uh, okay. Thank you. Call John Stewart. Mr. Speaker, and again, can I um, say it's good to see you back in your chair, and also my party, or my party colleague. Presumptuous there, my colleague from East Antrim, Stuart Dixon, it's nice to see him back as well. It's the first time that we've sat in the chamber since I was elected, so good to see you back, Stuart. Um, can I say um, I rise on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party to uh, support the motion and the amendment, but I would like to say that um, I probably would like to see the motion go further. I think, as has been discussed already in here today, um, we recognise the importance of the job retention scheme, but it's only one pillar of several pillars that are integral to supporting our local economy here. We talked about the grant assistance and an economic recovery strategy and, and also schemes 
that have not to date um, helped those who have been excluded from support measures and I think it would be so much more important if we were discussing that as well. So I think it is critical that we all agree that the executive not only finds the money to support businesses here but also um, is directed to create schemes whereby that money can be spent efficiently and effectively to help those who have especially missed out to date. Um, the introduction of the coronavirus scheme by the Chancellor was big and bold and was a huge move at the time and there's no doubt in the unprecedented nature of that um, with 80% of wages up to £2,500 a month to employees. Um, it was something akin to what we would have seen from a social democratic Scandinavian country than what would be used to from a Conservative government. Um, but it has also been an undoubted success. It's kept unemployment down to a level. Um, it's to a very low level. It's directly protected 9.5 million jobs across the UK and up to 300,000 jobs here and been a lifeline to those employees who would otherwise have not had an income Come and would be continuing to worry about their future. It hasn't been cheap, upwards of £40 billion, pounds, which is the member for South Belfast says will have to be paid back, and those, that amount of government intervention continues to grow by the day, especially with the other schemes that are there. But I think it has been essential to prop up the economy thus far, which makes it so frustrating that the Chancellor plans to end this in October, long before um, people who are affected by the pandemic are able to get back to work effectively. Um, there are some businesses are returning, we know that, um, and many who have been furloughed are starting to drift back to work, and that is also vitally important for the economy, especially as um, uh, Mr Middleton said, about getting people back into our town centres and city centres, getting people back into the workplaces safely is so vital for the local economy. But there are other sectors that can't get back, and we, we've mentioned them today, about wet pubs and the creative industry and the events sector and so many others who through no fault of their own, are either banned from reopening or just simply can't. And it is essential that a scheme continues to be in presence to give them the support that they need. Um, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, said that the furlough scheme, when he launched it back in March, would be a bridge through the pandemic. And I believe by withdrawing the furlough scheme prematurely, he risks building a bridge that does not reach the other side. I think it is integral that he finishes the job. Um, even to next June, the spend, potentially £10 billion, would be significantly less than that being spent so far. Um, but the cost of not doing it could be even more. And the impact on our economy in Northern Ireland of upwards of 100,000 jobs lost and maybe over, upwards of a million across the UK would be disastrous. We've heard today that Germany, Belgium, Australia, France, significant other countries have already pledged to extend their scheme, albeit in different guises, and I think that would be probably what is integral. We do know that businesses want flexibility, and those of us who speak to them want to know that if they can get people back into work, maybe for a period of time or part-time, or if they get people back and things go diff get difficult again for them, that they'll be able to slot back in. I think that is integral as well. So we can hopefully all send a joint and strong message to the Chancellor and to Boris Johnson. And he's getting that from all sides and, and, and also from his own government or from his own backbenchers. I know Julian Knight over the weekend, the Conservative Chair of the Culture, Media and Sport Committee, said that there's growing momentum for that from all industries, especially those that can simply not get back or, or seek to exist under social distancing. And he said that the British government would look ridiculous and set the economy back a generation if our world-leading creative sectors go belly up for the sake of a few billion. And I know we're talking about billions here and billions there, but given the gravity of this scheme and the fact that we're, the, the British government is spending money at a rate not since, seen since uh, wartime efforts, I think for the sake of a few more billion, it would be so, um, almost ridiculous if we did not support those. Um, the protection, as I say, of key skills would be um, should be a strategic priority and um, will be the building block of getting the economy back up and running post-COVID. And I think it's integral then that that um, scheme is there to support those that are unable to get back, but those key skills need to keep existing. Um, so, like I say, I'll finish off, Deputy Speaker, by just saying I do think it is important that we recognise how important this scheme is, but also that it's only one pillar of so much more, and the executive needs to play its role. And I think it is imperative that we see more of that money that was released or returned from the grants and budgets being made available for those that have been excluded. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Member. Could I call Andrew Muir, please? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it's good to see you. Um, in your place, alongside my colleague uh, Stuart Dixon. We've had many Zoom calls over the months, but we've never actually met in person until <laughs> today. So, um, the launch of the furlough scheme in March was an unprecedented but much needed decision by the UK Government. Few would dispute that uh, had it not been brought in, the situation today would have been infinitely worse. I will forever remember the moment furlough was announced on the 20th of March. 
After previously standing in a local business on St Patrick's Day, the staff, owners and I in tears facing down the prospect of closure and redundancies. Furlough saved that business and the jobs of the employees, but many others still need furlough to survive. Failure of the UK Government to reverse its decision to end the scheme next month would have catastrophic consequences for working people and their families across Northern Ireland. The Lions Party supports an extension because the furlough scheme is necessary given the restrictions on our lives opposed as a result of COVID-19. Most importantly, we must acknowledge that the vast majority of people who are furloughed desperately want to get back to work and are really worried about the grim alternative if this scheme is ended, namely prolonged unemployment without the means to sufficiently support themselves and their family. I know these people, they're friends, they're worried what's going to happen in October, and they're desperately keen to ensure that furlough is extended. We have a furlough scheme because necessary COVID-19 restrictions have made thousands of jobs temporarily unviable. People didn't see this coming. Thankfully, some of those restrictions have been eased and large numbers have gone back to work, yet important restrictions remain, making derailing previously viable jobs. We must continue to support these jobs or risk losing them forever. While the executive has been able to loosen restrictions, we are well aware that some of those may need to be reimposed, as indeed some already have been. Local doc lockdowns, as we have heard today, are also a very real possibility. For businesses that have uh, run out of any reserves following six of the toughest months on record, the furlough scheme remains vital to ensuring that they can afford to keep hold of their staff. The requirement for an individual establishment, such as a restaurant, to close for weeks at a time because of a case or cluster of COVID-19 could be fatal for the business if the furlough scheme is not there to support staff costs. Speaking to a local businessman a fortnight ago, his business has emerged from the lockdown with his reserves eliminated and £26,000 worth of debt, but he's determined to make a go of it. Forcing his and other businesses to close once again would, without any assistance, such as the ability to furlough employees, would, I fear, be the last straw and result in closure of that business. Mr Deputy Speaker, if we were to end the furlough scheme, we would be asking furloughed workers to either find new jobs or rely on support from existing and very limited safety nets. We cannot expect those uh, uh, furloughed in Northern Ireland to find new jobs that simply don't exist. The furlough scheme is expensive, estimated at over £35 billion at the end of August. But we have seen other similarly placed countries, such as Germany and Ireland and others mentioned here today, recently extend their furlough schemes well into 2021. If these countries can stand by their workers for the duration of the pandemic, there is no reason why the UK Government cannot do the same. Furthermore, there is strong evidence to suggest that ending the furloughing scheme in October would cost more money in the long term than closing it. Analysis from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research has shown how, through curtailing unemployment benefit claims this year and several years into the future, Continuing the furlough scheme into the middle of 2021 is the least expensive option. As other members have also outlined, Northern Ireland also has its own economic powers. We have many money that has been allocated through Barnet Consequentials still sitting unallocated. It's essential that it's allocated, and it would be frankly unforgivable if departments were surrendering money at the end of the financial year without uh, rolling out support packages uh, as soon as possible. In conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we still need the furlough scheme, and closing in October, as planned, would be a big mistake. Furlough is not a luxury, but an unprecedented scheme for unprecedented times that is absolutely necessary to support a large number of workers in Northern Ireland. I support the motion and the amendment. Thank you. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I would like to say hello to Mr Dixon. We, don't, we believe we have been met yet. Um, I welcome this motion and amendment today. Extending the furlough scheme would, of course, go some way to provide a safety net for many workers that have been affected by this pandemic. It is inconceivable to expect businesses that have been unable to reopen or those who are not open, able to open fully to survive without any further support when they have had little, if any, income since March. Grants only cover so much, and loans just kick the financial problems down the line. 
Many trade unions have rightly been calling for the extension of the furlough scheme for months to protect jobs, livelihoods and families across Northern Ireland. It's a no-brainer. We know the magic money tree can be shook when it is suited. But it's not a long-term solution. What we need is imagination. We need to think differently and we need a bespoke economic plan for the people that we represent. The motion call is calls to action is clear and something I support, but what difference will it really make in light of the British Government already refusing to extend the scheme? The key question here for this Assembly is what are the Executive's plans to create new employment opportunities for the estimated 100,000 people that are going to be un unemployed by the end of the year? What about those not included in this figure who are already struggling? Those who have had their hours cut? who are in precarious and unstable working conditions, those relying already on our social security system, those who are having to give up work or not being able to return because of childcare decisions, those who are self-employed, and those who did not qualify for the grants and assistance offered by Westminster or by the executive here. They have been left behind and excluded, and there is nothing that extending the furlough scheme can do to help them. Take, for example, a constituent of mine who has been left behind and I'm glad she's given permission for me to mention her today. Mrs Judith Cree had set up her own business in Hollywood in April 2018, but did not meet the criteria in the scheme set by Westminster, nor any implemented by the executive here. She, alongside others, including excluded NI, have lobbied for assistance in line with Scotland from the Department for the Economy and from this executive, and have been turned down repeatedly. She has also lobbied for the scope of the criteria to change, but has also been turned on, down on that too. She was informed that she was not able to avail of as much support as others and that it's impossible to provide funding for every scenario that has presented itself during this pandemic by the Minister. But why is this executive not listening and acting to help those that need it? What are the plans to protect jobs under threat? Where are the plans to create new jobs? And how are the executive using available funds and investment to drive forward economic recovery? Where is the imagination and what of the underspend? There are new ideas and new ways of dealing with economic recession and increased unemployment here. We do not need to look too far for opportunities presenting themselves, issues that we know we need to deal with, which will necessitate job creation. Dealing with fuel poverty, for example, and the poor condition of housing here is one example. The mass retrofitting of houses that is required for people is a perfect example of what the executive should be doing and investing their energy in, not focusing on business as usual. What we need here are green jobs and a green stimulus package from the executive. We need a just transition to protect workers and create jobs from the future. And this will require investment in people, education, apprenticeships, widespread and far-reaching structural change, including cooperatives and community-based models of business to implement a fair and just transition to low-carbon economy backed by green investment. This Assembly has already backed a Green New Deal and it was agreed with New Decade New Approach. So where are the green jobs? Where is our economic plan and a just transition within it? Whilst we welcome the call for extending the furlough scheme, it's also time for the Executive to pull the finger out, present this Assembly with a comprehensive economic plan and deliver green jobs for the future. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, it would be hard to dispute some of the recitals in this motion, recognising the significant impact that the COVID-19 crisis has had on the public, noting projections of more than 100,000 people could be unemployed by the end of the year. But I do have to say, there's something churlish about this motion. No acknowledgement whatsoever of the very substantial assistance that has kept our economy afloat. Now, of course, as taxpayers, we're entitled to benefit from our membership of the, U of the UK, and that, of course, is the big advantage of being in the UK. But I don't think it would have really done the proposers of this motion any harm to acknowledge the sheer scale of assistance that has been provided. I have always thought one of the self-inflicted dangers for devolution, not just here but elsewhere, is the risk of it simply becoming a grievance machine. Can't blame Westminster 
for everything. My goodness. In respect of expenditure here, this executive hasn't been able to spend to date all the money it has received in respect of COVID from Westminster. Mr Dixon rightly told us, and I'm sure each one of us could add to it, about the small traders who have fallen through the net with no help, a haulage sector with next to no help, yet money in the coffers not provided. So before we take the uh, moat out of the eye of Westminster, maybe we should have a look at our own executive. But there's some, of course, and their whole raison d'etre is just to blame the Brits. With, with Mr O'Dowd's, in a moment, with Mr O'Dowd's infamous share of bees comment, we had the illiteracy of our finance minister talking about the lockdown being blamed, could be blamed on austerity. There does come a time when this assembly has to grow up in terms of recognising responsibilities in the here and now that are here, not elsewhere. Yes, I'll give away. I'm a free Kevin Way. Um, I uh, don't deny that um, it was a huge effort and a huge amount of money which come forward uh, for the furlough scheme. But I think this would be a smaller uh, step in order to try and retain it and not be on our political thought and our political wishes in order to try and maintain our economy as, as battered and bruised as it is. That the furlough scheme should not be extended, but it can't be extended forever. There are businesses which sadly will never reopen. Some point, some realities have to be faced. You can't just keep putting your hand into the pocket of the Treasury if there's no economic, if there's no realistic prospect of that spend turning good. So there does come a point, hard as it is, for politicians in a devolved arrangement to face such realities when those realities will have to be faced. Because as Mr. Stalford said, someday someone, possibly down to our grandchildren, are going to have to pay for this. Do we really want to create such a mountain of debt on future generations for the ease of being able to say, we found money off the money tree in 2020, I think there does come a point when reality has to settle in. Yes, sir, further scheme without it would be in a very dire situation. But I think you cannot realistically expect that things will just go on indefinitely like that. There does come the personal and the collective community responsibility. And I'm sure there will be other needs as we go forward to be met, perhaps, in different ways. Yes. Thank the member for giving way, and whilst I appreciate what he's saying, would the member not agree with me that given we bailed out the banks in 2008, we can certainly do a wee bit more and bail out our people? I'm not going to defend the bailouts of the banks. They were treated with considerable generosity. Well, I'd but ask so the too, member to draw his remarks to a close. So too has the community in general. And I don't think the two wrongs ever make a right. I'm just making the point, some point, people have to get real about economic future. Thank you. Agus Nish, Adam, Sir Jerry Carroll, Axelum Mogum, Sir Higgin Fuenji Shin, Kai Me Rudbug, the Yanaman Shaw. Just before I move to that, uh, Jerry, the uh, order paper isn't expected to be disposed of by 6 pm in accordance with Standing Order 10.3. I will allow business to continue until 7 p.m. or until the actual business is completed. Uh, please continue, uh, Mr. Carroll.
Rugged, Nascar Corlegs Fodder Roof. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the COVID crisis has vividly illustrated across the world uh, that not only do workers make society function, but they create the wealth in our society, not the billionaires, stockbrokers, bankers, or venture capitalists. Workers create the wealth in society. And it's worth observing this fundamental uh, reality here today because for too long, Political representatives in this chamber and in the Westminster Parliament across the water have propagated policies that attack working class people. And for too long, our economic system has existed uh, based on exploiting the labour power of workers and concentrating wealth in the hands of the few. Our hospitality workers, retail workers, cleaners, porters, office workers, construction workers, public sector, health workers, and everyone else. They create the wealth and prosperity in our society. And to paraphrase the radical thinker Karl Marx, even a child knows that a society that stops uh, working is a society that struggles to survive. The cost of this uh, crisis um, is now being unfairly forced uh, onto working people. And whilst people in the hospitality sector um, lost their jobs, uh, the wealthy continued uh, to do well uh, during this crisis. People like Richard Branson, a billionaire who sits on his private island championing his own bailout, whilst avi aviation workers uh, are unsure how long their jobs may uh, exist. Or the Debenhams workers uh, who have been let off, undermined, disrespected, whilst the company remains profitable and wealthy. Not to mention, of course, um, the completely disproportionate experience between those who have worked extremely hard putting themselves at risk at meat plants and other food production outlets, and the likes of Larry Goodman and others, the beef barons, who have been left untouched by this crisis. Bosses who have private wealth of hundreds of millions of pounds and assets totaling hundreds of billions, um, they sit on fortunes. Uh, food production workers have been placed at risk uh, throughout this whole crisis, underpaid, disrespected, and too many have tragically paid with their lives. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 remains a dangerous reality in our communities. We've heard, obviously, uh, today of that. Uh, in our workplaces and schools, we've witnessed a rapid increase in cases uh, in the last few weeks and, tragically, deaths as well. Any idea that we have bypassed this pandemic or that we have come through it is not only inaccurate, but very, very dangerous thinking. And the executive should bear that in mind, especially as it moves to lift uh, more uh, restrictions. Mr. Speaker, the furlough scheme uh, should absolutely be extended, as we have heard already in the debate. If the German government can extend a furlough until the end of 2021, and the French government uh, until 2022, why can't workers here have similar protection for them? It is likely there will be no vaccine uh, until at the earliest next year, and workers do firmly need security and protection and must not be forced to choose between risking their health and risking their jobs and, by extension, their futures. It is worth remembering as well that the furlough scheme was not implemented out of the goodness of the Tories' hearts. I believe the Tories do not have good hearts. They implemented the scheme because they knew they needed the state to step in in order for the system to survive, otherwise they risked great instability, short-term protection for some workers in order for long-term protection of profits was the real reason for their actions. And Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, in any debate about the economy uh, in this chamber, we always have pleas against whipping the bagel bowl uh, to London. I think we have to reject this caricature of reality, Mr. Speaker. It isn't London's money, it's taxpayers' money created by the labour of workers uh, here, and we need more of it, not less. And the reality, uh, as Oxfam said in 2014, £4 billion pounds worth of cuts have been delivered in the North, uh, likely to be higher uh, now. That is the highest since uh, the World War II. There is a fundamental historical problem of underinvestment by the British governments uh, and public spend on public services here, uh, but also in working class communities in Wales, England uh, and Scotland. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, always when there is a discussion about lack of funding, the need for investment, the need to protect people, I am struck how we often refer to what I would say uh, as unfair and outdated proposals, normally water charges, prescription charges and higher fees. I think we have a, a different focus, which focuses on the need to maintain public services, but making those who have more wealth 
pay for it, and that putting extra burdens on the working class and, and, and poor uh, communities. We need to see uh, corporate wealth tax uh, to ensure those with the most uh, the member to uh, are forced to, to pay. Close, please. Uh, I think there is plenty of money in Britain and Ireland to make that happen, so we will leave my comments there. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess next year, I'm sorry, John O'Dowd, the Creek of Correlation last year. I guess that Greg Nome dug it. I can now call John O'Dowd to on the, the, the amendment, and you have five minutes. Carmi August last can call you on Falcher or Arish Spack to us all, and also to Mr. Dixon as well, who, who's, who's back among us. Um, it's been an interesting debate. Um, I think we have managed to unite the House. In, a, in, in their call for the furlough scheme to be continued. Uh, we have socialists and Tories and liberals and right-wingers and left-wingers all coming together supporting this uh, economic proposal. And it comes about because we are facing this overused word, but it is true, unprecedented times. Uh, at the start of this pandemic, uh, during one of the earlier economic or economy committee debates, I, I said to officials, what we need to do is rip up the economic rulebook, and that's what has largely happened over this last six months. And the reasons why uh, the Tories introduced a furlough scheme was to, to secure jobs, was to try and stabilise the economy, but it was also to allow that fundamental principle of the market to continue: consumption. The consumers would go out and spend, because none of this money, I suspect, has been hoarded away and savings accounts are under the mattress uh, of those who have benefited from it. Uh, it has been used to consume, which keeps the market ticking over. Now, that can be argued as to who that benefits the most. Uh, certainly, I think those families who were, who were saved by the furlough scheme have welcomed it very much. I think they will be concerned by Mr Allister's comments that two wrongs don't make a right, comparing the furlough scheme to bailing out the banks. They're not comparable. They're not comparable at all. Uh, one was right and the other was wrong. Uh, so those families who have been saved by it, I'm sure, have been very welcomed by it and will want to see it continue. I am concerned when I hear people, and I've seen this in the media as well, that Boris Johnson has made a decision. He's not going to continue. Boris Johnson never made a decision in his life. Boris Johnson takes a position. Whatever the moment in time is, whatever that position is, whatever shoots that moment in time, Boris Johnson takes a position, as surely we've all learned from experience. And I think it's only right and proper that the Assembly debates it. Uh, the Welsh and Scottish uh, Assemblies have also debated it. And we make a call on the British Government to continue the furlough scheme. Not because I blame the Brits for everything. I blame them for a lot of things. I don't blame them for everything. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic is not the fault of any one nation. I will have certainly, and Mr. Allister referred to them, my concerns around how certain governments have managed it in terms of health care, etc. But there had to be an imaginative response to it, and there has been an imaginative response to it. It would be foolhardy, even from a, a Tory point of view, to end the furlough scheme now. Because the, 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 the support it gives to the economy will be lost. And some members have made reference to the cost that will be in terms of unemployment benefit opportunity costs uh, that are lost, skill sets that are lost, industries that are lost. And that, that cost to the economy will be totally detrimental and long uh, standing and have a major impact for generations to come. Uh, some Mr Stafford referred to and others have referred to, our children will pay for this in the future. Yes, they, they may well do if, if an economic strategy is put in place that workers pay for this. But why should workers pay for it? It's, it's, it has been a cost to uh, the economy, to, to the Treasury, but the money that ended up in the Treasury came about as a result of workers. They created the wealth, they paid the taxes, went into the Treasury, and now they've got uh, some of that payment back. So why, why, I don't think we should accept this principle or this idea that our, our children's children will pay for this. The, the, the way the economy operates is that the books have to balance. Somebody will pay for it. But let's introduce a fair and equitable taxation system. And uh, I don't wish to be picking on Mr. Allister, but me and him have a habit of doing it to each other. He, he, he referred to the, the politics here has to mature. Well, here's a challenge for us all. 
Let's establish the commission into fiscal powers for this assembly. Let's this assembly start talking about and making decisions around tax varying powers, about raising taxation. Not necessarily raising a set piece of taxation, but tax has to be paid. Tax has to be paid to pay for public services. The question that we have to debate and answer is who pays the tax? And I think that is a sign of maturity yes, of this establishment and of the executive. Conclusion. So, in conclusion, uh, I welcome and I would call on members to support the amendment and the motion. And I would also say the maturity of this assembly is based on what we do next around fiscal powers. Sir Matthew O'Toole, Conclude your Corps, and Wallow. I now call Matthew O'Toole to conclude and wind the debate on the motion. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it's good to see you back in the chair. I think it's the first time since since we've reassembled that um, you've been in the chair when I've spoken. Um, yes, I'm pleased to be uh, rising today to um, wind on our SDLP motion and also to be supporting the amendment. Um, uh, laid by, um, by Sinn Féin. Um, it's been a really useful debate today. We um, are often divided in this assembly, but there is broad support for the principle of extending the furlough scheme to protect Northern Ireland workers, uh, businesses and our families. I will make some general remarks, but I will also try and reflect on the debate more broadly, which, as I said, has been useful um, broad. Um, there are a few interesting comments that I will that I'll pick up on. Um, uh, some I don't entirely agree with, possibly, um, uh, um, possibly the, some of the same ones that uh, Mr. Dowd picked up on, but possibly not for the same reasons. Um, but I should say, uh, to, to start off, I welcome Mr. Dowd's uh, commitment and uh, interest in um, uh, new fiscal powers for this place and in establishing a fiscal council and or a fiscal commission. I um, look forward to working with him and his colleague, the Finance Minister, on that. If we can get um, credible proposals, that would be good. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this has been the most challenging and frightening summer in memory uh, for many workers, uh, in a public health sense, but also in an, in an economic sense. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in, in a, just over an hour's time, uh, some of my staff and indeed some of yours will be participating in uh, some online training on provision of universal credit. And the reason that's essential is because we know that in the months to come, Whatever happens with the furlough scheme, we are going to see in our constituency offices a significant increase in people who are going to have to be supplied with universal credit provision. That is a very difficult reality that we are going to have to face, but it does not have to be as bad in the short term as it might be, and that is what today's motion and today's debate has been about. As we have heard, uh, over 330,000 people uh, in Northern Ireland are either, are either receiving support through the furlough scheme or the self-employed support scheme. About a quarter of a million of those have been on furlough. Just under one in eight UK workers are still on furlough, with the uh, majority uh, having their wages topped off um, uh, by um, uh, still, uh, with the majority having their wages topped up by an employer. Um, the withdrawal of the furlough scheme, um, obviously the, the taper has already begun, but the withdrawal of the furlough in total in October will be a drastic cliff edge both for the workers, their families and indeed for their employers. It is highly possible, as several, um, uh, as several contributors to today's debate said, that simply there will be a, a large volume of micro-businesses in Northern Ireland that will not reopen their doors. Once the furlough scheme ends, they will have no revenue to pay their staff, wages staff, who may have been with them for a long time. Um, but uh, once the furlough comes to an end, there is no plausible way for them to continue to pay them. My colleague, Pat Catney, uh, particularly raised in a very, um, uh, um, uh, in a very heartfelt and passionate way the, the cause of uh, small pubs in, in Northern Ireland and several others, um, including I think Andrew Muir um, talked about the, the, the stresses faces the hospitality industry, not just Andrew Muir, I believe Christopher Stalford talked about it as well. Uh, I know all uh, Assembly colleagues, I do know this is something that, that's, that's universal a, a, across the House, that people are concerned about the volume of correspondence we are receiving from constituents, fearful for their jobs and frankly worried about their family's future. Um, more than 40 per cent of employees, uh, more than 40 per cent of companies um, uh, have said they have already cut jobs and a further third say they are likely to make workers redundant in the next six months. This month, 
uh, BDO, the uh, auditors and accountants, found that more than half of medium-sized businesses in Northern Ireland were planning to cut jobs once the furlough scheme ends. In the accommodation and food services sector, uh, more than four-fifths of workers in Northern Ireland have been relying on the furlough to keep their jobs. Northern Ireland's 81% uh, take-up is the highest in uh, for that sector is the highest in the UK, and again, Pat Catney um, talked uh, very clearly and uh, resolutely about um, about that sector. Um, indeed, um, others talked about the sector too. Kiva Archibald specifically talked about the need to increase uh, flexibility. Um, the, the, the the amendment that uh, Sinn Féin laid obviously talks about. Um, uh, greater flexibility around entry requirements and uh, in addition to the extension to the, to the furlough and we welcome that and support it. Um, in manufacturing, a higher proportion of workers in Northern Ireland are benefiting, benefiting from the scheme than in England, Scotland or Wales. Several people talked about manufacturing in the aviation sector. Um, Christopher Stolfer drew particular attention to the, white, to, to, to the, to the Im impact on, on the manufacturing, uh, manufa manufacturing aviation, uh, particularly in constituencies like East Belfast and indeed, um, uh, and indeed I think East Antrim, John Stewart's constituency. Um, and Stuart Dixon's as well. Um, last week, Mike Brennan, the Permanent Secretary in the Department of the Economy, warned that the full impact of the crisis has not yet begun. A Conservative estimate for unemployment claimants in Northern Ireland before the end of the year is uh, 100,000. That's an extraordinary number. We are a small uh, jurisdiction, we're a tiny jurisdiction, less than 2 million people, and we're also a small community. The impact of 100,000 job losses will be extreme. It will be extreme for families and for communities uh, across this place. So to those who say that this isn't mature politics for this assembly to use its voice, and let's not forget that for three years we didn't have a voice, with respect, Mr Alistair, for those to say that it's not mature for us to call for an extension to the furlough scheme, I think isn't... Yeah, happy to give away. In fact, I said no such thing. I said that I supported the extension of the scheme, but I think we had to recognise, and this is where the maturity comes in, that you can't go on forever uh, uh, pouring money, uh, that there has to be other ways to create employment and keep employment, because if there are companies which are never coming back, you can't keep pouring money into them. It's pretty simple. Um, well, with respect to, to the Honourable Member, uh, and just to, to, to take the point more broadly, he said that um, we have to face reality sooner or later was the, was the point he was making, and he was talking about, um, he also made the broader point about us needing to be slightly more supplicant in our uh, gratitude to HM Treasury. Well, I, I used to work at HM Treasury. I'm not, I, I'm not under any illusions about the nature of that department and the work that its officials have done and the necessity of this scheme, nor do I blame the Brits for everything, to use a phrase that, was, that, 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 that people have used. Uh, I used to work in that department. It's not the case that we are in a situation where uh, we have, we're in normal social or economic times. The whole point is that the, our economy cannot operate at full capacity for the foreseeable future. We hope, we all hope it's sooner rather than later. It would be great if by the end of this year, our pubs and hospitality sector and our retail sector were able to have a more normal Christmas. I'm afraid I don't think that's very likely. So the point is that the extenuating circumstances that prompted the Treasury to make this intervention at the beginning of this year, not at the beginning of this year, in March, haven't ended yet. To be honest, they haven't ended yet. So therefore, it's completely correct to extend this furlough scheme, and as uh, John Stewart was saying, it isn't just uh, you know it, it, it isn't just people in devolved assemblies. It isn't just left wingers calling for an extension to the furlough scheme. Um, he mentioned Julian Knight, a Conservative backbencher, is calling for an extension to the furlough scheme. We aren't just talking about uh, what you might see, Mr. Alistair, with respect as the usual suspects. So, uh, as I said, 100,000. Uh, we could face uh, 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 we could face a claimant count of 100,000 um, by the end of this year. The gravity of that number is enormous. I've talked about communities in Northern Ireland, but it's nearly double what we faced in 2012, 2013. And as we've heard, um, governments across Europe are working to implement variants and extensions to their own support schemes. Germany, France, Spain have already indicated um, they're going to extend those schemes. My colleague Nicola, Ma Nicola Mallon talked about, I think, uh, talked about that. I think others have too. I know there are some in this chamber who aren't particularly keen on looking to Europe as an example, but I'm afraid in this instance it's important that we do. So it's important that we echo the appeals of political leaders in Scotland, Wales, Scotland and Wales to the British government not to leave UK workers. Christopher Stalford, has, my constituency colleague, uh, has uh, left the chamber. He was keen to um, have a little pop at Nicola Sturgeon. That's entirely his right. I would uh, 
say to, 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 to my South Belfast colleague, as someone who's enthusiastic uh, camp, uh, supporter of the Vote Leave campaign, if we're talking about political leaders who've made false and disproven promises, then I'm afraid the Vote Leave campaign will beat every political campaign in history, not just in these islands, but probably anywhere in the world. Um, so, um, if we abandon entire sectors and hundreds of thousands of workers in a few weeks' time, we will regret it. Not just we'll regret it, our economy and our communities will suffer. The instinct of the British government uh, might be to move to um, austerity, to counterbalance the wage subsidy schemes that have kept people in work. We know from the last decade that this does not work. I'm running out of time, so I won't talk in great detail about why it's wrong to think of a state's um, public debt liability as the same as a, as a household balance sheet. But I'll leave it as this. It just isn't. They're completely different things. It's clear from Boris Johnson's recent please actions, today's to actions in relation to, relation to Brexit that he's entirely reckless about uh, the future of people in Northern Ireland. But it's important that we in this Assembly send a clear message to the, today that we want to support workers, families and businesses and we want to extend the furlough scheme. So I'm uh, grateful for uh, support and I commend the motion to this House. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Kiva Archibald, John O'Dowd and Melissa McHugh be made. Those in favour say aye. aye. No. Contrary. No. Okay. Except the amendment has been accepted. So therefore the question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary. No. No. The motion as amended is then Carried. Thank you very much indeed. The final item of business then is um, item number five on the order paper, the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you.